And we have yet another presentation coming up next. With us today is Professor Dr. Evelyn Krohn, Vice President of the European Research Council, Brussels, Belgium. Warmly welcome. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Is this working? Yes, yes, really, really well. Okay, fantastic. Um, so if you allow me, I will, would like to share a couple of thoughts uh, with you in the next uh, 30 minutes. Um, and first of all, let me thank you. Uh, thanks especially to the Slovenian Science Foundation for organizing this wonderful celebration of science. It's certainly a packed and fascinating program. So thank you for inviting me uh, to contribute. Now, for those of you who do not know me, I'm a professor in developmental neuroscience in society at the Erasmus University Rotterdam, and I lead the Society Youth and Neuroscience Connected Lab. I examine the psychological and neural processes involved in self-regulation and social development with a special focus on adolescence. And since 2017, I have had the honor to be a member of the Scientific Council of the European Research Council and one of its three vice presidents since 2020. So hopefully I can pass on some reflections from my own career, uh, both as a researcher and as the vice president of the European Research Council. Now, the European Research Council was set up in 2007. Its aim is to provide flexible long-term funding to high potential individual researchers. ERC grantees can be of any nationality and work in any fields, including the social sciences and humanities. And the aim is to give ERC grantees the freedom to develop ambitious projects of their own choosing. Now, we believe that the work of our grantees is the ultimate proof of what we do. Our grantees are great ambassadors of science in Europe, and we en encourage them to show off their results. In particular, we feel strongly that scientists should engage with the public. So that's one reason we were happy to support this European Science Festival. And just last week, we launched the second ERC Public Engagement with Research Award contest. The aim is to recognize ERC grantees who have demonstrated excellence in engaging with audiences beyond their field of research. A prize of 10,000 euros will be awarded to the best applicant in each of three categories. Involve citizen science, inspire public outreach, and influence media and policy. We look forward to announcing the winners at the Euroscience Open Forum or the ASOF conference in July, 2022. So that's something we are doing right now. And I think it's really important for scientists to explain their research. These days, more and more, we are being challenged to demonstrate the impact of our research before we have even started. And to explain how we work might solve a particular problem in society or contribute to economic growth. So faced with this, sometimes it is tempting to give in to say that our work on new materials or computer science or microbiology or archeology span might have some implications for climate change, for example. But I think this does not, I think that this does serve everyone a disservice. When we study complex phenomena, then the outcomes and the implications of what we find are uncertain. And there is likely to be a wide range of implications that go beyond any one box, such as climate change. And I would like to explain what I mean by giving you an, an example of my own work. And hopefully I can show that even when our research is quite specific, the implications for society can be very wide. So today I would like to tell you about uh, our work on adolescent development. Why adolescence? Well, this is one of the most intriguing phases in human life. The period between approximately age 10 to 25 years of age, during which young people expand their social networks outside of the family context and develop into young adults who contribute to society, so, uh, such as through education, work and mature relationships. So how does this transition from childhood to adulthood take place? And what are the circumstances through which we can nurture the next generation? 
Now, you may think that the problems of today have no place in the minds of young people, but this is a misunderstanding. It was already Socrates who said, the children of today love luxury, they have bad manners, contempt for authority, they show disrespect for elders and love chatter in place of exercise. So already 2,500 years ago, we thought that young people did not care about the future. But in fact, the contrary is true. When we talk about adolescents, three important changes stand out. First, adolescents have a strong tendency to take risks. And this is not for no reason. It is necessary to explore your world away from your parent. It would be no good if all young people would stay with their mom and dad. And it's something we also see in animal research. Young people take more risks than children and adults because they need to explore and learn. Second, adolescents show changes in their friendships. Friendships become more intimate. Whereas eight-year-olds might say that they have friends to play together, 15-year-olds would say that they have friends because they can trust each other. And these more intimate friendships form the basis for respectful relationships later in life. Third, young people develop a need to be heard, be seen, be respected for their ideas and opinions. This is not something unique to adolescents, but it's particularly important in this phase of life, which is also known for greater creativity and novelty seeking, for example, in domains such as fashion and music. So Socrates was right in a way, Every new generation of youth questions the practices of the previous generation and wants to form their own future. I now told you something about what adolescence is generally known for over centuries. But each generation of young people also grows up with its own challenges. And this generation grows up in a particularly challenging world. We face multiple crises at the same time that place high demands on youth such as the recent and ongoing pandemic, but also the climate crisis and the crisis of increasing social economic inequality. So how to navigate all these global challenges that move beyond the borders of one country? Whereas this may seem very challenging, there are also reasons to believe that this, this young generation is well equipped to face the rapidly changing and increasingly complex social world. This generation is known as Generation Z, defined as a generation that was born between approximately 1997 and 2010. So they are now between 10 and 24 years of age. What do we know about this generation? Well, first of all, they grow up as digital natives. They are the first generation that does not know a world without internet since birth. And this means that they can connect to others around the globe, irrespective of time and location. There have been several studies that examined how Gen Z is different from previous generations. First, they generally are more focused on the needs of others compared to previous generations of youth. And second, they generally use less drugs and alcohol compared to previous generations. But even, these are, even though these are generally positive trends, inequality increases such that not every young people has the same chances and opportunities. And this is something we should aim to avoid. It's noteworthy that young people also experience more performance pressure and burnout complaints compared to previous generations, possibly because of the higher complexity of making the right choices. So how can we make sense of this unique but highly complicated phase in life? My own lab tries to understand these changes by examining changes in brain growth and function during childhood to adulthood. And we discovered that adolescence is a time in life that can be defined as a unique window of opportunity. In my lab, we make use of MRI scans, and this is a relatively novel method that allows us since approximately the 90s to examine in vivo brain structure and how the brain works when we think and act. It's completely non-invasive, making it suitable also for research in children. And what we discovered is that there is a rapid increase in brain cells or neurons, the working power of our brain between conception and birth and ages approximately six to seven years which is when children have the most brain cells they will ever have in their whole life. And with the onset of puberty, 
This is approximately around the age of 10 years. We see a second interesting phase in development. This is when brain cells start to reduce according to the principle, use it or lose it. Brain cells that are very efficient become stronger and brain cells that are no longer used are being eliminated. And this goes on until the early 20s, after which brain size stabilizes. So we have discovered in my lab, but also other scientists, that these periods in rapid neural change are associated with larger susceptibility to the influences from the environment, such as learning, risk-taking, and peer pressure. So taken together, adolescence is a formative phase in development. The experiences and social environment set the building blocks for mental health and societal commitment later in life. But this life, life has been quite different in the last two years for adolescents. Rather than connecting together and learning through the social mirror that others provide to you in a normal life social environment, many adolescents were behind screens and were deprived of their basic social needs, risk-taking, connecting with friends, and having a voice in society. Indeed, we have seen the mental toll in the last years. The longer the pandemic lasts, the stronger the effects on anxiety and depression. Research in my own lab has shown that over the course of the pandemic, adolescents' feeling of tension and depression increased and feelings of vigor decreased. And this was most visible in adolescents in their late teenage years and early 20s. For them, these effects were stronger than for children and older individuals. And this was not only observed in my own lab, but by scientists around the world. So what can we do? Where lies our responsibility? As scientists, as agents of change, as citizens in society? My lab felt strongly committed to make our scientific work of value for the next generation of young people. We need them to develop creative solutions for the problems we face today. They are our future employers, dentists, doctors, waiters. So in collaboration with youth workers, we aimed to reach out to young people, all young people, also those who are often underrepresented in our research. Also those who typically do not have a voice in society. We organized youth panels and we asked young people, what is your question to us, to the scientists? And how can we make a difference for your generation? The answer was very clear. Many young people asked us, how can we contribute? How can we have a voice in society? The young people expressed a fundamental need to contribute. For example, through helping to make meals for elderly, helping out in testing streets or other activities in which they could make a difference. And we see similar results last week in Glasgow. Many young people traveled there to have their voice heard in the climate debate. They want to be seen and noticed and have a voice too. So my own lab, which consists of approximately 15 brilliant young scientists, took up this challenge. We combined our scientific work over the last 20 years, where we examined how the brain was associated with drives, well-being, resilience, creativity and societal contribution and made this knowledge accessible to young people together with young people in co-creation. And once we were able to explain the unique potential of the young generation, we asked them to think of actions to take. This led to a new platform, Young Experts. And this platform is highly interactive using various live and online tools. For example, through Instagram, we share knowledge of facts and actions, which are then voted for by young people. And what is highly important to us is that these ideas are being fed back into policy. And with success, we collaborate intensively with the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Internal Affairs. And last spring, we handed over a youth manifest to our Prime Minister, Mark Rutte. So what should you take away from this? There are three things that I would like you to remember. First, our research on brain development has shown that adolescents, the teenage years and the early 20s, are a formative period in development. It is worth investing in. 
Second, mood fluctuates more in puberty and the first mood disorders have their onset in adolescence. Environmental influence have an impact on well-being. And this was illustrated by the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, many young people were suffering from burnout symptoms, possibly related to the high demands of our times. And three, there's something we can do. Young people have a fundamental need to contribute to change society. Every new generation feels this need, and we can help them to give them the tools to contribute in the best possible way. I hope this summary demonstrates that the complexity and the very broad significance of research in just one area of adolescent development. And this is why funding science is so important. If we attempt to channel all our resources towards political priorities, we can miss out on the most surprising and valuable results, which often come from unexpected places. In contrast, the bottom-up nature of ERC funding is designed to channel funds into new and highly promising research areas and to capitalize on the diversity of European research talent. The ERC approach also means that we fully recognize the value of social sciences and humanities and the need to support them on an equal basis with the physical and the life sciences. There's, of course, no doubt that new and improved technologies can make major contributions to addressing some of the many challenges we face. But we also desperately need new ideas about how to live sustainably, how to confront inequality, how we might work and live and educate ourselves in the future. We need more imaginative forms of governance and ethics. We need to understand the causes of fear and anger in our society as much as the amount of CO2 emissions we produce. And only the social sciences and humanities together with the whole science disciplines can provide these answers. It is a sheer range of issues we face and the complexity and the uncertainty of the world around us. And that means we need researchers to be working on a wide range of areas. That is why the approach of funding only a limited number of priority research might be a naive one. Some politicians accept the argument, but they will tell you the citizen demand that research funding only goes to certain areas that they understand. And this is sometimes linked to the idea that we are maybe facing an age of fake news, disinformation, and the rejection of experts and the rise of populism. But maybe we should have more faith in our fellow citizens. Regular surveys are conducted in many countries of who the public trusts. And what we find is a remarkable degree of trust in scientists and in the power of science to make life better. The most recent Eurobarometer survey of European citizens' knowledge and attitudes towards science and technology was published just in September this year. And this survey shows that fully nine in 10 EU citizens, 86%, think that the overall influence of science and technology is positive. They expect a range of technologies, notably solar energy, 92%, vaccine and combating infectious diseases, 86%, and artificial intelligence, 61%, to have a positive effect in the future. And results reveal a high level of interest in science and technology, 82%. Respondents mo most often mention health and medical care and the fight against climate change when asked in which areas uh, of research and innovation they believe there can be made a difference. And similar results are found across the Atlantic and in all countries around the world. Um, a Pew Research Center survey in the US in 2018 found that, and I quote, public confidence in the scientific community as a, role, as a whole has remained stable for decades. In, in marked contrast, citizens have very limited confidence in politicians and in the government to improve things. So, who do we really have to convince? So in conclusion, 
I hope this talk gave you some new insights into the value of the next generation. And I hope it will inspire you to think about how we can give strength to the young people of the future. And in terms of how we support science, I believe that all healthy research systems need to allow some space for researchers to use their creativity and follow their passions. Some consider this approach to be idealistic, but I consider this approach to be necessary in order for science to have its maximum impact for the benefit of society. On promoting science, I believe that researchers themselves are the best people to do this. And I'm glad you are providing a showcase for so many of them during this festival. I also believe that the ERC can set a clear and inspirational target for frontier research across Europe. We know that we can't fund every promising researcher in Europe, but maybe we can inspire every ambitious researcher in Europe. Finally, I believe that the development of science has always been collective, public and cross-border. Science can unite and engage communities of people in pursuit of knowledge. It has done this from the start. And that is why the ERC Scientific Council fully supports renewed efforts to develop further the European research area. And that is why uh, also the ERC Scientific Council has urged all of those who believe in the positive power of science to make your voices heard during the ongoing conference of the future of Europe. It's absolutely critical that Europe continues to support and promote the value of science, and in particular to ensure that research remain an attractive career for the next generation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Dr. Evelyn Krohn, uh, Vice President of the European Research Council, Brussels, Belgium, for this uh, inspiring presentation, uh, for encouraging our belief uh, in our children and uh, future.